I made for you. Beautiful flowers, beautiful trees, delicious fruit, amazing animals. It's all yours because I love you so much. And there's one way that you can show me how much you love me. He said, don't eat from that tree in the middle of the garden. Consider it your form of worship. Don't eat of it, and you'll never bring sin into the world. And what did Adam and Eve choose to do? I mean, like God had barely left the room, and guess what they were doing? They were eating. They were being disobedient. They were sinning. And immediately, sin infects their hearts. You see it in the story, because in the first time ever, they were ashamed, remember? And they sewed fig leaves together and put it over them because they were embarrassed, because they were naked. And then we see that for the first time ever, they begin to blame people, right? When God confronts, um, confronts Adam, he says, It was Eve's fault. She made me eat it. And then... He says, he, uh, and then he says to Eve, what about you? And she says, no, no, it wasn't my fault. It was the snake's fault. He made me do it. And then finally they get around to, no, no, God, it's your fault. You shouldn't have put the snake there in the first place and the tree and all that stuff. And for the first time ever, they also feel scared. God's coming. He's going to be really mad. We better hide. And that's why the Bible says that sin entered the world through one man. And are you part of the world? You are. So here's a little harsh truth. Sin is within you. Now there's people that somehow think that sin is God's fault. Um, why did he put the snake there? Why did he put the tree there? Why did he create human beings in such a way that we could sin? Do you remember the end of the creation story? At the end of it, God said, that he made everything, and all of it was very good. You see, it had to be, right? God doesn't create things that are imperfect or sort of, eh. God makes perfect things. And God made it all good and perfect. So sin didn't originate from God. It can't, because he's only good, and his creation was only good. Let me give you an example. It's sort of like Google Maps. Google Maps will listen to you, won't it? You can tell it, um, give me the directions to the next city. You can tell it to avoid the tollways. You can tell it to how to stop and find the local Sonic. Um, Google Maps will listen to you, but it doesn't love you. And God, in his perfection, made people to love. And he gave them freedom because he wanted us to love him on our own accord to choose to freely love him. And Adam and Eve chose to freely oppose him. And so sin isn't on God. Sin is on us. And God isn't the one who originated sin. But God is the one who will come and exterminate it. I want you to hear from Romans chapter 5, these words. Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man the many will be made righteous. You see, Adam's one act of sin is juxtaposed with God's perfect act of rescue. Adam and Eve did one sin that brought all people into sinfulness. That includes you and me. And then God did one act of righteousness, which brought all people into justification, which includes you and me. Now, what is justification? Well, it's a courtroom term. It means a not guilty verdict. It means that in spite of your sinful heart, God's righteous actions declare that you are not guilty. 
not filthy, not defiled. And how does that happen? How does it happen? Do you remember earlier I mentioned that there were three people who had never sinned? I told you about two of them, Adam and Eve. Let me tell you about the third one. The one who entered this life in perfection and chose to stay that way. He was God with skin on. He was Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. He is the new Adam. Remember back when I talked to you about the stain on your shirt? If you have a stain on your shirt, one way to get it out is you take a clean rag and you get it wet and you blot at the stain until it's all out. And of course, once you do that, the stain's not on your shirt, but where is it? It's on the rag, right? That's what happened with Jesus. It was like a sponge. He soaked up all the dirt and sin and shame of your sin and my sin and all the guilt of our past and all the shame of last week. And Jesus soaked it all up into his heart and he goes to the cross and he dies for our sins. And three days later, Jesus rises from the dead, but our sin never does. It is exterminated. It is no more held against us. So what does all this mean for us? I hope it affects the way we live our lives. I hope it affects the way we deal with the sin in our own life. You see, I think there's some practical things you and I can do. We'll never get rid of all the sin ourselves. We're not capable of it. But we certainly can choose to make decisions that do not lead us into sinful actions. Here's a practical thing I think you could work on this week. See, I think one thing that happens to us when we get ourselves into sin is that you and I um, make our actions based on our emotions, right? Have you ever gotten really angry at somebody and then sat down to write them an email or send a text message? This is bad, this is bad, right? You should hit delete before you hit send, right? Because we're acting out of our emotion. And what I find is that the more I act out of my emotion, the more likely I am to do sinful things. We, 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 don't, we can't act normally. And so what if we began to tune out our emotions and, and instead act in a different way, not emotionally? So let's suppose you're in a situation where you get angry. What if you took a breath and some time to think and pray before you said or acted in any way when you're in that emotion? Here's what happens when I do that. What I've noticed is that the emotion goes down And I can think and act more clearly and less sinfully. It also allows me time to remember something. That the Bible tells us not only is sin planted in our heart, but you know what else gets planted there? The Word of God gets planted in our heart. You see, God plants the Word of God in our hearts right by our sin to remind us of some stuff. He plants it there to tell us, remember how much I love you? Remember how I gave you the gift of a Savior? Remember how, what sin does in your life and how you ought to be motivated to try to get rid of it? He plants within us a knowledge of what's pleasing to God and, and a motivation for us to do the things of God. Have you ever seen one of those pictures of, um, like at a trash dump, where there's all this trash, and it's stinky, and dirty, and disgusting, and somehow, by the grace of God, a little flower is growing up right out of the middle of it? Isn't that the picture of our hearts? They're sin-filled, but somehow, by God's grace, by the power of God's word, a flower grows there. By God's word, sin is defeated and diminished, And by God's power, we're able to bloom in the midst of sin. That's the message of the gospel. 
Will you never be a sinner? Nope. Can you work to be less of a sinner? Yes. Can you do things that please God more? So don't act out of your emotion. Take time. Pray. Ask God to guide your steps in those moments that you might more faithfully follow his word and bloom where he's planted you. Let's pray together. God, we give you thanks for the power of your word planted deep within our sin-filled hearts, God. Help us in moments where we find ourselves reacting to stop and to take time and to pray and to ask you, God, to show us a different way. We thank you more than anything else for the gift of Jesus who bore our sins to the cross, that we would be found not guilty. We give you thanks for his life, his death, and his resurrection. And it's in your son's holy and blessed name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you'll stand with us as we close in song. There's something powerful when you hear your six-year-old in your ear singing about amazing grace, right? Because she understands what it is. So 
She's not going to listen to me now, though. <clears throat> so, now with your head up and your eyes open, receive with joy this blessing. Go forth into the world and love God and your neighbor and all that you do, and bear witness to the love of Christ in this life, so that those who haven't yet known it might find within you a warm and a generous friend. And may the love of God and the peace of Christ and the communion of God's Holy Spirit be with us today, tomorrow, and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.